An ideology like a myth is something that people believe in. But it's also a term that suggests that an ideology works in the service of an interest group. Right? It's, it serves a particular function in society. So that gets me to <coughs> my, I don't know if it's a radical position or not, but it, it's my answer to the question, why should we be talking about whiteness? For a long time, people talked about race, or discrimination, or bigotry, or prejudice. So in the midst of all of that, why should we be changing the conversation in this way? Doesn't it in some way just, you know, privilege white people all over again? Oh boy, Greg gets to get up and talk about being white. <laughs> I want us to define what white privilege is. I mean, what is it that we're talking about? We, we, we hear the different examples and the experiences people have, but what are we talking about? And these are the kind of things that we emphasize to our students. Defining white privilege or defining privilege. Privilege exists when one group has something of value that is denied to others simply because of the social groups they belong to in a social hierarchy rather than anything that they have done or failed to do. Now privilege is something of value that's denied to others and given to some for something they really had nothing to do with. That's, that's privilege. There are two kinds of privileges. Unearned entitlements, And that's the, the things of value that people should have but are granted only to certain groups, like the freedom to walk down the street and not be afraid, um, those kind of things. Then there's conferred dominance. And that is when one group of people has direct power over another. So, so those are, that's a, concise for the definition of what privilege is. But there's another part of privilege, and this is the one that is a little bit more difficult to maybe understand. The flip side of privilege is oppression. There cannot be privilege without oppression. If one is privileged, then someone else is oppressed because of it. They're denied. So a privilege takes away, gives it something to you, and takes it away from something else. It's, it's being pressed and held down by social forces, by social forces. And, and I want to emphasize, not necessarily individual, social forces. Um, oppression closes the doors of social opportunities. Oppression is relational. It can only exist in relationship to privilege. We learn racism from the day we're born, and we learn to react and behave, and we'll talk about this a little bit later when we talk about getting off the hook. We, we, we learn how to react and to, to certain social situations, um, and they're all dictated by race, race and gender. The basic social divide in the United States has historically been along the lines of race. Uh, second is gender. It, racism helps to maintain a general system of exploitation and oppression. The word racism, at least in the United States, but I think I, I will make the global case. The word racism is a code word for white supremacy. There would not be racism without the ideology of white supremacy. What racism is, is an ideology that creates wealth and power for fair-skinned individuals. It, it, has, it functions to aggregate wealth and power to fair-skinned individuals. It's an ideology that distributes power 
and wealth, and it works very, very well. There wouldn't be racism if there weren't white supremacy. The purpose of racism is white supremacy. If you go into South America and look at the way the color line operates in those countries, fair-skinned people are given privileges. If you go to Japan and look at the way that young girls and others are having eyelid operations, so they have Caucasian eyes and not Asian eyes, we're talking about white supremacy. If we look at the way in which Muslims in America are now being racialized within the black category, what we're talking about is white supremacy. So my position in these arguments, and I think it's deeply in sync with Sanders, is that the talk about racism is fun, but it doesn't get us to the heart of the matter which is the oppression created by the ideology of white supremacy and the social structure of inequality that it perpetuates. Capitalism, or I should say racism, has been of tremendous service to the establishment and maintenance of capitalism. Because ultimately it's all about money. It's all about profit for people. That's what drives the society. And Again, racism has been capitalism's most valuable asset because it is a way in which all of us can be held down and oppressed, if you will. You know, you get the kids in class and they say, well, my relatives didn't own slaves. Okay, let's pedal back on that one. So. Who did the plantation owners buy their horses and supplies from? Right? White merchants. So they made money. They didn't own slaves. They made money. Who did they sell the cotton to? Oh, the people who made the shirts in England and in New England who were able to make the shirts at a profit because the labor was slave labor. So these white men working and women working in the mills of New England, taking home a paycheck, their wealth depended on slavery. They profited. Every white person in America today has more wealth because of racism and white supremacy. We all have unfairly had our wallets stuck by it. And unless you understand the systematic nature of economic inequality and the way that it pervades the entire system and that white people were able to aggregate wealth in their homes and in their mortgages and pass that on to their children and their children, unless that structural nature of oppression that Sandra's talking about is named for what it is, will always be lying to us.